Our guest speakers are Jens Peterson and Glenn Wright. They are going to introduce themselves. Um, they are, in fact, cousins. I learned this recently. And they are both lawyers. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for agreeing to be presenters this evening. I know that you know an awful lot, and I, for one, am dying to hear more about electric vehicles. Well, uh, I will just, uh, uh, Karen asked us to introduce ourselves, so I'll tell you a little bit about me and then turn it over to Glenn and, uh, and then we'll fire up our uh, presentation. Uh, so my name is Jens and uh, uh, as she mentioned, I'm a lawyer in Regina um, and I've been driving an electric car for, I guess, about four years now and uh, been loving it. And uh, we'll tell you more about that. And um, my, uh, in my family, uh, my extended family, um, uh, my parents have an electric vehicle. My uncle has an electric vehicle. My cousin has what, three electric vehicles? <laughs> Um, so, so there's a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of electric vehicles in the uh, in the family. Um, so, with that, I'll turn it over to Glenn. Uh, thanks, Jens. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so, it's true that I work as a lawyer, but I would say that I don't self-identify as a lawyer. Um, I worked as an engineer for 20 years before um, deciding to dedicate the last half of my career to climate change and the necessary energy transition that I think we, our society needs to undertake. So that's what prompted me to abandon engineering and, and go to law school and become a lawyer. So I have ambitions that I would like to use this trade to pursue strategic litigation, to try and force our government to, to take more ambitious action on climate change, because particularly in Saskatchewan, I don't think that we're gonna see our provincial government do anything unless they're told to do so by the federal government or told to do so by a court. So I would like to actually self-identify as a farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm, but all my extended family farmed and I was always so jealous of my cousins like Jens because they got to live in the great outdoors and farm. So that's what I would really like to do, but uh, you can't farm unless you have old money or other people's money and I have neither. So I think um, we're going to, if you'll have to bear with us a bit, because Jens and I haven't practiced this presentation together at all. This is our first time delivering it sort of as a tag team. And um, I'm also on a rural internet connection. So if I get to break up at all or whatever, I might turn my video off. But that's why we've got Jens hosting the presentation. So I'll try to follow Jens's lead, I guess, and um, hope that it works out. You guys can see that now, right? Yep. Good. All right. Well, I guess I should speak to this slide since this is my mugshot here. But yeah, I purchased my first electric vehicle in April of 2018. So we're approaching five years. And then uh, that was a used car that I bought because I've always been a very, very much a miser and reluctant to open my wallet for anything, especially cars, which I don't view as an investment at all. They only cost you money. But that Nissan Leaf uh, was the most expensive car I'd ever purchased in my life, used at $19,000. And um, it was proof of concept for me. And it gave me enough confidence to justify buying the only new vehicle I've ever purchased, which was that Hyundai Kona. And then uh, we were so impressed with electric vehicles. We, have, we had at the time five drivers in our household. And so we sold our other gas commuter vehicle and bought a used Chevy Bolt from Go Electric Calgary is a used EV dealer there. And they shipped it to us on a trailer. Uh, we bought it sight unseen. And then my son, I've been helping him. He converted a, a Dodge half ton truck to run on battery electric as well. Just this summer we finished it. So I'm also on the board of Sask EV. And this summary here is showing just how many kilometers I've driven and what I estimate our savings for our family have been thus far. And this is my, uh, my, my experience. So uh, shortly after uh, Glenn got his electric car and was uh, uh, enthusiastically gushing about the benefits of it, uh, 
at some point a few months in uh i got to uh, got to drive in it and uh you know glenn is a very persuasive uh, persuasive guy he knows his stuff um he uh, he he uh, uh you know he backs up uh, his opinions with uh, with data and uh, solid thought. So uh, it wasn't very long, and I was thinking like, why aren't I driving an electric car? And and I started looking around. Um, now my in my household, uh, I've only got one driver, uh, and uh, and so I was like, well, you know, I've already got two vehicles, which is seems like a lot for for one driver. And how can it possibly make sense to get a third? Um, but I started looking around and I found this uh, also used uh, smart car. And um, like Glenn, I, I bought it sight unseen, uh, had it shipped, it, bought it in Quebec and had it shipped on a uh, trailer to Regina. And, um, and, and it was almost new. Like I think it had maybe... 14,000 kilometers on it or something like that, even though it was a, was a four-year-old vehicle at the time. Um, and, uh, but I figured that what I was gonna save in, uh, in monthly fuel costs would, uh, would just about pay for the, uh, for the licensing cost of it. So I, uh, I decided to, uh, to go ahead and, and make the plunge. So these are uh, these are some of the benefits of of uh, an electric vehicle from uh, from my experience. I mean, I uh, would have to say that uh, I, I truly love my uh, my little car there. The driving experience it's uh, uh, with its size, it's uh, very easy to park. The electric uh, part of it, it's uh, got very good um, acceleration, far better than the acceleration you notice in most little cars. Um, so it's, uh, it's very, uh, very easy to maneuver in traffic and, um, you know, I, <laughs> I can probably be just about any gas vehicle, uh, off the, off of, uh, off of a red light for all of about, you know, 20 meters. Um, you know, after that, they'll, they'll catch up to me and pass me, but, uh, but, uh, but boy, I can get going pretty fast. Um, uh. I, there's a, a meme going around the uh, social media these days showing this uh, electric car that uh, uh, had a fire by, I think it was Medicine Hat or, or maybe it was Red Deer, and there wasn't much left of it other than kind of like a melted, charred body uh, on the highway. And so people are like, oh, you know, these darn electric vehicles are so dangerous. And uh, the person who showed it to me, I'm like, well, you know, there's not much left of a gas vehicle once it's been through a fire either, and they're no safer. It's, uh, but electric vehicles are far less likely to start on fire. Um, uh, I don't think there's any risk of them exploding, uh, unlike a, uh, uh, like a gas or diesel uh, vehicle. Um, the maintenance costs are, are minimal because uh, uh, while your while your suspension and and uh, steering like those components are the same as a, a gas or diesel vehicle, um, you don't have oil changes. Your your electric motor has uh, has uh, very few moving parts uh, in contrast to a to a, a internal combustion engine. So, and, and they're very reliable. Glenn, any comments? Well, I would say the maintenance costs are, are much reduced because of the simplicity of the drivetrain. And then you also will experience far less wear on items like brakes because the electric cars all have regenerative braking. So when you come to a stop, you can use the car or in a such a way that you put all of the energy, the kinetic energy in your motion back into electricity in the battery. So it's a great way to recover energy and it's partly why electric vehicles are more efficient. But in my own personal experience, I've driven 150,000 kilometers between these three vehicles. And the only maintenance I've had to do in that time is to plug two tires. So um, it's, it's quite substantial that you're not doing oil changes. You don't have to worry about oxygen sensors and timing belts and all of the other doohickeys that there are on, on gas cars, because it's just very much simplified. So this slide, I guess, is talking more about some of the challenges associated with an EV and getting into an electric vehicle. And 
The biggest one would be the cost. There is right now a higher upfront cost to getting a new electric vehicle. And the used options, unfortunately, with the price of fuel having skyrocketed in the wake of you know, our geopolitical un instability, the demand for electric vehicles is now very high. And, and where Jens and I had bought our used vehicles before that demand, um, I think many of these, certainly probably both our cars, we could sell them for probably what we paid for them, even though it's two years later and kilometers have been added. Um, but that's not going to stay that way forever. I think we've crossed the tipping point in terms of the industry recognizing that it's not a matter of if electric vehicles are going to become commonplace, it's strictly just when. Um, and you, you're seeing that with the policy response from many governments around the world banning the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030 or 2035. Uh, Canada saying 2040 will be the last year, I believe. But the other challenge would be the lack of charging infrastructure, which was much more of an issue when I first started driving, but is slowly being um, addressed. But when you think about how you use the electric vehicle, most of my charging, I would say 95% of it happens for my commuting purposes, either at home in my own garage or at work where I park all day. And then the only real challenge that I think that people have to be aware of is the decreased range in wintertime. And that's because they are so efficient, these electric motors, that there isn't any waste heat coming off. And so there isn't any excess heat to keep, to, uh, keep the window clear or to heat the cabin. You have to use power from the battery. And again, because these batteries and the electric vehicles are so efficient, the amount of energy you're carrying in an electric car is really the equivalent of only about a gallon and a half of gasoline. So like six to eight liters of gasoline is all the energy you're carrying. So that's why your range decreases in wintertime because you have to use the battery to heat the cabin, defrost the window. And of course you have higher rolling resistance with you know cold oil and bearings and higher um, friction with the air density being thicker in the wintertime with cold air. You notice all of those things in electric car because you're using so much less energy. So there's three different types of, uh, of uh, electric vehicles. Um, mostly what Glenn and I have been talking about are, are battery electric vehicles, the ones, the option at the bottom. Um, there's also your hybrid uh, and the, I guess you may call it the conventional hybrid or the one that's been around for, what is it, probably going on about 15 years now, maybe, maybe 12 years uh, that we've had hybrids. Uh, those are simply, they've got a, um, a uh, fairly small battery in them. Uh, they don't plug in and they simply uh, uh, rely on recouping some of that kinetic energy that Glenn was talking about as you slow down. And then the battery basically uh, powers the vehicle uh, either while you're stopped uh, and idling uh, at, a, uh, at a light or, uh, or when you are going at a low speed. But because it's got a very small battery, they use up that uh, you know, the, the electricity that they do have stored very quickly and, and switch over to, uh, to gas. Uh, and then you've got the plug-in hybrids. So these ones are, um, uh, they're still called hybrid, but they do plug in, they've got a bigger battery. And so you might even be able to drive 40 or 50 kilometers uh, without using your, uh, your gas motor at all, just using the electric motor. Uh, but then if you, for instance, are going on a longer trip, then, uh, then you've got the, uh, the gas motor that will uh, kick in and, and, uh, and keep you going. Um, do we have a slide later, Glenn, that talks about some of the upsides and downsides of, of each of these or when they might be appropriate or? Yeah, I think it's on each one of the, there's examples of each of these, I think that follow this slide. Okay. Yeah, so, so here's, the, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, Glenn. Well, this is the example of a hybrid electric vehicle. And so actually Toyota introduced the Prius, I think in 2005. So we're actually getting to close to 17 years. But as Jens mentioned, this has a small battery, but it, it always needs gasoline. The assist, the hybrid drive, really you're only getting assistance from the electric uh, propulsion. It's very rare that one of the hybrids that isn't a plug-in hybrid can actually do any extended, you know, long range or even the 40 kilometers of range. Most of them are just purely uh, an assist feature to try and reduce the amount of um, need for the, the gasoline engine 
or to allow you to have a smaller gasoline engine that's more fuel efficient and then still provide the acceleration that you expect from a, a larger engine. But these are the least efficient. They always need um, similar maintenance to what a conventional car would. And of all of the you know, more environmental options that we've talked about, hybrids, plug-in hybrids and battery, these would have the highest environmental impact over the life cycle of the machine. Yeah, so this is the example of a plug-in hybrid vehicle. And so this is the uh, Mitsubishi Outlander, which is a very popular SUV. It does have a larger battery than what the previous, the hybrids were, so you can plug it in. I think it has, typically in this these plug-in hybrids, we're seeing ranges that are somewhere between 20 and 75 kilometers. So uh, generally the, the newer versions have longer ranges. So I'm thinking particularly of the Chevy Volt. So that's with a V as in Victor. That Chevy Volt is one of the first uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles to come on the market. They did stop production of it uh, or discontinued that model, I think, in 2020. But the later versions of it did have longer range in that 70 kilometer type um, uh, range expectation. They do need gas uh, whenever you're driving more than that, what your battery can tolerate. And they do often run the gas engine in the wintertime because that battery being so small, it cannot provide uh, the heat necessary to heat the cabin and the, to keep the window clear. So quite often plug-in hybrids, you will find that they always do some uh, operation of the engine in winter time. And then this is the battery electric vehicle. This is showing a 2017 Chevy Bolt. Um, and this has these types of vehicles, the battery electrics have the largest battery, the lowest maintenance, um, this is sort of going all in on the, the electrification future, if you will. It probably has the highest upfront cost, as we talked about right now, but does over the life cycle of the vehicle lead to the least uh, environmental impact. And the ranges are getting longer and longer all the time as battery technology develops. I like to tell people this is a bit of a story, but prior to World War I, there was a three-way race for personal transportation to replace the horse. And that was between steam, electricity, and petrol. And it was only because of World War I that that, that was the first time that uh, taxis and petrol was used to ferry troops to the front line in that war. Every other war had been fought within a horseback ride of a railway line. So it was after World War I that we stopped focusing on that three-way race and really embraced internal combustion engines. So the battery that you use to start your, your internal combustion engine car is really old technology. Flooded lead acid batteries have been around for almost a century. So what I tell people is that we're doing a lot of focus now on battery development that hadn't been done for about 80 years. And that's why you're seeing battery cars getting better and better so quickly. Really every year. Um, and, and I want to touch on something that Glenn mentioned um in in you know like i think with glenn and i we probably tend to assume that people know what we're talking about when he when he talks about electrify everything but but really one of the the the, the technological solutions to climate change at least in the uh, in the short term is is electrifying things and it's because uh you know there's just so much so many efficiencies uh to running things on electricity uh, with uh, with basically any sort of um, uh, internal combustion engine, uh, there's just a tremendous inefficiency and a lot of just uh, fuel burn that goes out uh, as heat uh, into the atmosphere. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to say about that, Glenn, before we carry on. Yeah, I, I didn't put a slide in here on that, but I've got some great slides I used today in my other presentation, but essentially, a gas car only is about 20% efficient at best. These electric cars are 80% efficient. So they're four times more efficient. So in, in terms of operating, that is how you have less of an impact on the environment because you only use a quarter of the energy that you would otherwise in a, in a fossil fuel powered vehicle. And that's why you see such drastic savings in the operating cost, which we'll show later in a slide I've got here. Okay, so we're now moving into the functionality of these of these machines, how they operate. So this slide is just showing the very basic components of an electric car. 
So unlike a gas car where you have a fuel tank and a, a, a gas engine usually, and then you have a transmission that has multiple speeds, an electric car doesn't have a transmission at all. And the battery on all of these electric cars usually is sitting on the floor, it's sort of like a skateboard platform is what I tell people. The battery is down low, low to the ground. So you have a low center of gravity because the battery is the heaviest component in the drivetrain. So often weighing as much as 1200 pounds. Uh, so it's quite heavy. But the flip side benefit to that is these cars are much harder to roll because they're not, um, they have a much lower center of gravity. Um, so the battery is the biggest component. The motor uh, is usually um, coupled with a, a single speed transmission. So it's there's no gears to shift. You only have from zero RPM on the motor up to about 12 or 13,000 is probably the upper end on most of these vehicles. Um, and usually that gearbox is just a, it's just because it's a fixed ratio, there's no shifting or moving parts to slide gears back and forth. It's, it's meant to last for the life of the vehicle. That's the only component really that holds oil. Um, the other components that you would find here is the, your air conditioning compressor, which often can be reversed to use as a heat pump. And, um, and then the other components shown here are really just the charge port is the only thing you as a user have to know about. This is where you hook up the, the car to the charger so that it can recharge the battery. And, and for me, I tend to just every time I drive my car home, um, plug it in. And uh, these have a very sophisticated battery management system that knows how to make sure the battery is never overcharged. I mean, we've all, I think, have an experience of having bought a cordless drill you know, over the course of our lives and you get frustrated because after two years the battery is dead well there's no protection on that and it's easy to overcharge them or they get damaged the next slide here i think actually shows um, a couple pictures of the stripped down car chassis so this is a, a tesla i think this is a tesla model 3 and here this is showing now a motor in the back and one in the front as well so this is an all-wheel drive version but the bottom is the battery there that kind of flat it's a structural member in the Teslas, so it's part of the frame. And if you go to the next slide, this is sort of zooming in on how the battery is actually made. So these batteries are a series of, you know, in many, many of these little round cells is what Tesla is using. Some other manufacturers use a little pouch cell. So the Nissan Leaf is one. The pouch cells are more like uh, you've got a little pad of paper. Imagine this is what the pouch looks like. It's just a, a thin thing and they're all stacked together. But the pouches then have less surface area and they're harder to pull or dissipate heat from. So that's why Tesla's use these round batteries, which more, look more like a double A battery. And then the battery's constructed in such a way that coolant can actually flow through the whole battery to both either heat the battery in the winter time when it's cold or cool the battery in the summertime or when you're doing a lot of fast charging. So that's all part of this special battery management system. It's trying to make sure the batteries stay at their ideal temperature to protect the battery because that's one of the most you know, expensive pieces on the car and what's gonna determine the lifespan of your car is how well the battery is protected. So the manufacturers have recognized that and built it right into the car system. So often when you're seeing the car charged to 100%, it actually isn't the 100% maximum the battery could take. The manufacturer has purposely derated the battery to protect it from being overcharged, all in an effort to make sure these batteries will last for a very, very long time. So if you go to the next, uh, yeah, at one point we've got a slide here that shows actually a Tesla has gone over a million kilometers already, and I think it's only on its second battery, so go ahead, Jens. Well, uh, so this is uh, you know one of the big questions for for uh, us who live in this province uh, as we're approaching winter is how well they work in in uh, in winter time. And of course, we've all had experience with an internal combustion engine uh, vehicle where the battery uh, didn't handle didn't stand up so well in the winter. So that's you know one of people's very first questions is how does it work in the winter? Because they're thinking this old style of lead acid battery. Uh, and they're, you know, they're remembering that time when they had to get boosted or, or, uh, you know, they went out and it was minus 25 and the car just went, roo, roo. Uh, well, as Glenn mentioned, these are, uh, these are temperature controlled. Um, uh, the, the, they're actually 
because of the battery and because they're controlled like this, they're actually a far more reliable uh, winter vehicle than a gas or a diesel. Um, you know, there's, there's virtually no chance that you are going to go outside in the wintertime and turn the key and your, your electric vehicle won't work. You know, th th that, that's always a, a risk with a gas or a diesel that you turn the key and you find out that your battery is dead or you left the light on and it drained the, uh, uh, drained the battery. Um, that's not going to happen uh, with, these, uh, with these vehicles. And in fact, I don't, don't recall if it was Glenn or somebody else, but they actually, um, they parked their, their electric vehicle outside, I think it was for two weeks in the winter without charging it. And uh, you know, two weeks later, it um, uh, it had only lost a very small amount of its uh, of its charge. Um, you know, just expending uh, some of its energy to to keep it warm. So they're uh, extremely reliable. The heaters are are very quick. They uh, uh, you know, instead of you know, my commute is is a four minute commute. So with uh, with an internal combustion vehicle. Um, I don't even worry about uh, turning on the heater when I, if I'm using my uh, gas vehicle in the winter, because it's not, it's not, it's not even going to be making a difference to the, uh, to the heat by the time I arrive at my destination. Well, with my electric car, um, it will, it heats up very quickly, like within, you know, 30 seconds, you can feel actual warm air blowing out of the uh, blowing out of the vents um, so that's uh, that's very nice for comfort um, traction control I you know with my little smart car one of the things I was worried about was like gee how is this little vehicle going to handle in uh, in snow when the snow is uh, you know 10 12 inches deep and there's these big ruts and uh, just a little car how is it going to hand up well my, my car is, I think, 900 pounds heavier than the comparable electric, or sorry, the comparable gas or diesel smart cars. So it's actually far more stable and has far better traction. And it actually handles, uh, I find, better than my Toyota, my front drive Toyota Matrix. Um, my smart car is actually a rear wheel drive, um, but it handles better than my Toyota Matrix with a front wheel drive. Uh, even though the Matrix is a uh, is a bigger vehicle, um, uh, so that's uh, that's uh, now there are other issues with my car that I don't love about the winter time that I won't get into because that's that's a manufacturer issue, not an electric vehicle issue. But uh, but uh, uh, th things are not all uh, rosy with my uh, with my winter time driving. <laughs> I will say that each vehicle is a little bit different just in how they've set up the battery management system. And so the Nissan Leafs actually don't have coolant flowing through the battery. They're one of the only ones that only has resistive heating. So they only can heat the battery up when it gets cold. They can't actually cool the battery when it gets too hot. And that's why the Nissan Leafs got a bad reputation when they were first introduced in Nevada and California. Some of the batteries failed prematurely uh, due to overheating. But this was the first generation Leafs that were released in 2010 and 2011, 2012. Um, they did change the batteries afterwards, but the point is that they all behave a little bit differently. So actually I was the guy who did the two week test. I had my Chevy Bolt one winter, I parked it out and we just used the other car for two weeks straight and we let it sit out there just to see what would happen to it. So it sat two weeks at minus 30. I went out and pushed the button to start it and it did light up and turned on, but it just said too cold to start. So but I plugged it in with the the little one, the small trickle charger that it comes with, and, and within an hour it said it was ready to drive, but it reduced capacity. But my Hyundai, on the other hand, it has, and on the Nith, Nissan Leaf that I drove, they they also used a little bit more power, I think, to keep the battery more in a state of readiness. Where Chevy's got their, uh, I guess, vehicle control module set up that if it's plugged in, it you can program when you want it to leave. But if you don't have it programmed, it just wants to be ready to go all the time. And so it does, I guess, use more power to keep the battery constantly ready, uh, where the Nissan Leaf and the Hyundai tend to allow the battery to get colder and not have as much phantom losses or parasitic loads, but then they allow the battery to uh, heat up as you drive it, because as you discharge, it does warm the batteries. But 
I guess the point is that they're all slightly different and you'll get to learn and know how your own car operates. And if you're interested in a particular model, my best advice to you would be to talk to somebody in your local electric vehicle club. They'll connect you to somebody who already owns a car like that. And you can ask those people real world questions of how it is to own one of those cars. So this is just data from uh, one of the Tesla drivers in Saskatoon. He actually recorded meticulously how many kilometers he drove at various temperatures and it recorded his efficiency. So the second column where it says watt hour per kilometer. So this is what electric cars, it's the equivalent of miles per gallon or liters per hundred kilometers in your electric car. You measure the energy you use by the units of watt hours or kilowatt hours. So you pay for a kilowatt hour from SAS power, usually at about 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So you can see here that the difference of summertime driving when it was 15 to 20, it's almost double the amount of energy that's used in the wintertime. And so that's why we always tell people that when you're looking at buying an electric car, think of how far you have to drive, make sure you get a car that's rated for twice that range, because in the winter time, in the worst case scenario where it's minus 40 and the wind is howling, your range will be about half of what it is in the summertime. Would you like to take this one, Jens, or? Sure, I'll give your voice a break there. So, um, yeah, so your your upfront costs are um, are, are quite a bit more. Uh, I think a Chevy Bolt, uh, it's kind of a starting price, fairly similar to that Nissan Leaf. I thought you could maybe get into one, maybe a little bit less, but it wouldn't be significantly less than that, anyways. Um, those costs are projected to come down. Um, uh, but of course, uh, and I think it, the range is still, if you're under $50,000, you qualify for a $5,000, um, uh, oh, so it says right there, 55,000. If you're under 55,000, you qualify for a $5,000 federal rebate. Um, uh, some of the other provinces, BC and Quebec, I think both have some, uh, some incentives for, uh, for uh, for battery electric vehicles there uh, of course you have to be a resident of bc or quebec to uh, to qualify for those um so you know the the dilemma in terms of uh you know cr crunching the numbers here is is like any other decision where you know something costs more up front but the operating cost is uh, is substantially less you have to you know you have to actually figure out you know how much how much uh, you know you plan to uh, how much you plan to use it what do you think your use is going to be like uh, in figuring out you know how long it will take you to recover that uh, that upfront investment yeah we could, this, this this slide here is just showing how batteries have come down in cost and so 2022 is sort of the first year that batteries have actually gone up a little bit in price and i would say that's just tied to inflation and generally, um, you know, the manufacturing shortage of supply chain problems tied with the COVID and the geopolitical turmoil we find ourselves in. But it's projected that by 2024, the battery price will be low enough that we'll be, we'll be seeing models being offered by manufacturers that are comparable pricing to gas cars. Now, I don't know if that's true necessarily, but as Jens mentioned, it really depends how far you drive because the capital cost to buy might be, even if it is marginally higher in 2024, it's the operating cost that is quite a bit lower and we'll show that here later. But the important thing to see here is that the trend has really dramatically dropped already in the course of 10 years. And that's tied to how we've, we hadn't been focusing on battery development and battery technology until recently. And here's that picture I was talking about earlier about this is a, a, a Model S uh, Tesla that has already got a million kilometers on it. And so most manufacturers are suggesting that the batteries will last for at least 300,000 kilometers. And most are offering warranties that are up to 160,000 kilometers, or in the case of Tesla, almost 200,000 kilometers. So that I, th I suppose it's like any other product. If you read the owner's manual and do use it the way it's intended to be used, it'll last for a very long time. But 
we all know horror stories of somebody who bought a gas car and didn't maintain it at all and the engine was done after only 50,000 kilometers. So, I mean, these things are certainly more reliable and uh, less maintenance, but they're not foolproof. I mean, any bad operator can destroy something. But from my perspective in Saskatchewan with where we use potash tailings and salt and sand, I fully expect the vehicles to continue to rust out before the powertrain dies. So these are uh, these are your options for charging an EV, and like most batteries, the slower you charge it, the better it is for the battery. Uh, but obviously, that's not always convenient. So on the left, you see what we call a level one charger or just your regular uh, 120 volt plug-in. Uh, that's actually what I use to plug my or charge my car. Uh, I haven't installed a uh, a special charger at home, and. Uh, you will hear people talking, uh, naysayers talking about how well the grid can't handle um, everybody having an electric car. Uh, what I've noticed is that uh, my car, I think, uses less juice than if I had central air conditioning. Uh, it, I'm not uh, uh, sure how it compares to uh, a big 60-inch television that everybody seems to uh, to have and leave on 24 hours a day. Um, but uh, uh, you know, nobody seems to be saying, well, we can't all have central air conditioning, the grid can't handle it, or we can't all have 60 inch televisions or the grid can't handle it. But but when it comes to electric cars, uh, they trot this uh, this nonsense out. Um, so then you can go up to a level two charger and there's a lot of there's a lot of free level two charging available, uh, you know, around uh, around the cities anyways. Um, you know, a lot of the hotels have level two chargers. PV Marts have had, uh, they've been kind of uh, leaders for a long time and, and they've had level two chargers uh, available. Uh, and you'll see them a few other places. Um, and uh, uh, and so that's, so for me, my car would take probably 16 hours to fully charge from say 20% to 100% on a level one. Uh, I think at a level two, it might take half of that uh, time. Uh, I've, I've never actually tried it because um, I don't have one available, but uh, but it it does speed it up quite a bit. But of course, my car has a very small battery, so I don't you know I don't have to uh, I don't have to add many um, uh, uh, kilowatts uh, into it. Uh, if you're getting a vehicle that has a bigger battery that you drive further, like a, for instance, a Kona, um, obviously you're using more, more electricity, more energy. So you're gonna wanna charge it a little bit faster. And, and certainly for those highway trips, uh, you're gonna wanna, uh, you're not gonna wanna to uh, stop and uh, charge your car for 16 hours. Um, so that's where the level three uh, DC chargers come in and uh, uh, Glenn, you've got, I, I don't have any knowledge about level three chargers, but Glenn, you've got some firsthand uh, knowledge. So why don't you talk with that? Yeah, well, the important thing to think of this as just the size of the, the pipe that's flowing the energy into your car. So that smallest one on the left, the level one, the standard household outlet where you plug in your, your hair dryer or microwave. If you drive your electric car less than 100 kilometers a day, you could actually get by on this. but as it shows seven kilometers per hour is what, what you're gonna get for range. So 12 hours times seven is 84 kilometers. So the first three months that we owned our electric car, my commute to the city and back for our, from our farm is about 85 kilometers. So as it turns out, we were able to just get by, but could only make one trip per day with our Nissan Leaf. That's what prompted us to install a level two charger so we just used the same 40 amp service that we had for a, you know, a welder plug in the garage. And level two chargers do vary in size from uh, about two kilowatts up to nine kilowatts. And so we installed a seven kilowatt uh, charger, which then allows us to charge at about 50 kilometers per hour. So now my 85 kilometer commute with our electric car, if I bring it back home and the battery happens to be empty, which is very rare, but can happen if, it, if we've come home from a long trip. The car would have to charge in our garage for about two hours and it would be ready to make a trip to the city and back. 
But when we drive from our house near Saskatoon to Brandon, Manitoba, or to you know any of these longer distant trips, generally if I'm going to Manitoba, I'll stop in Regina. So after 300 kilometers of driving, I'll stop and have lunch at the level three high speed charger. And uh, you know I park the car, plug it in, walk away, go have lunch and come back in an hour, it's fully charged and ready to go. The thing is though, people are charging you um, extra money, I suppose. It, it cost me about double uh, to charge my car at a high speed charger than what it would cost me if I used my own power from my house and, and my grid connection. And so this is how these places are starting to try and make some money. They believe their business model is that you should be paying more for the convenience of getting your electricity at a very high rate. And in some ways they're just passing on the costs they get charged from the utility because a SAS power, like many other utilities around the world has what's called a demand charge as well as a consumption charge. So the demand charge is having enough infrastructure installed to give you electricity at a very high rate, even though you may not consistently use that all the time. So that's part of the reason why you pay more for the convenience of high speed charging when you're out on, the, on long distance trips. And if you want, if you do a lot of long distance trips, this is a map now showing of the level three charges that exist in Saskatchewan. But by far and away, Tesla still has the best charging network for their cars. They've taken a very much a proprietary approach to this where they've built their own charging network to be used by their uh, customers and the, the people who buy their cars. But now that we're past the initial uh, stages of deploying electrification in, in transport, in other jurisdictions like the European Union, Tesla is now opening up their charging network to other off-brand cars. So I'm sure that will come in North America in a matter of 12 to 18 months. But when I first bought my electric car, none of these spots existed. So it was much, much harder to take your car somewhere because you had to plan on waiting for that seven kilometer per hour slow charging. So um, I know this is not complete coverage of Saskatchewan yet. I mean, if you're driving to Kindersley or, or uh, you know, Yorkton, we've got a way to go here, but I can tell you that there are already plans to install another 20 more chargers in Saskatchewan and they should be up and running. Federal money is, is being supplied to, um, build that infrastructure and it's supposed to be ready by November of 2023. And and like this map is continually changing. I, I think there are now level three chargers in Davidson, are there not Glenn? I saw an announcement from uh, the co-op there. Yes, yeah, so this, this, and I should clarify, this is not showing all of the Tesla charging network. This is just showing the ones for the off-brand. So Davidson actually had Tesla chargers about a year and a half ago. And just in the last uh, two months or perhaps less, it was that the ones Yen's referring to for the, the, the off-brand, everybody else but Tesla can now get a high-speed charge at Davidson. So this is an important uh, argument that it's, it's a myth, but you hear it all the time from people. Well, aren't EVs just powered with coal in Saskatchewan? Aren't they actually worse for the environment? Well, the next when you click this it says sort of but um i need to point out this is the um, forecasts for our power generation portfolio from sas power so these images are taken directly directly from the annual reports of sas power so on the left you can see uh, our generation capacity in the province is made up primarily of coal and natural gas uh, but sas power is projecting to see a, a dramatic increase in the amount of power supplied by wind and solar and um, hydro will probably stay about the same, excuse me. But the, the point of this is that as we slowly decarbonize our grid in Saskatchewan, other jurisdictions are doing it much faster, but EVs will get cleaner and cleaner as the grid becomes cleaner and cleaner. So if you go to our next slide, um, this is just showing the trend of coal power in Canada. And so all coal is supposed to be eliminated by 2030 in our country, which will make the grid much cleaner. Um, Saskatchewan might be lingering with our boundary dam number three that has CCS applied to it. Um, the next slide after this, sorry, I'm kind of going through this, but this here is a lot of numbers and I apologize for putting some math up, but as an engineer, I couldn't help myself. 
So when you look at the two columns here, 2022 is, is comparing the actual emissions and cost of operating an EV in Saskatchewan here today with our dirty grid to what a gas a car would do. So on the top line, our efficiency in kilowatts per 100 kilometers is 20 from an electric car. And, and that's a very conservative estimate. I actually get quite a bit better than that just by driving very carefully. But the next row down says the SAS power greenhouse gas emissions intensity in kilograms per kilowatt hour is 0.637. So 637 grams per kilowatt hour, which when you do the math, that works out to 12.7 uh, kilograms of emissions per 100 kilometers. If you look down at the next uh, gasoline, it says total GHGs per 100 kilometers of 19.5. So the bottom line here is the emissions reduction today in 2022 is 35%. So you're 35% cleaner with an electric car today in Saskatchewan. But if the grid cleans up the way the provincial government says we will clean up the grid by 2030, that will then increase to 57% emission reductions with the same car. And here I'm also showing the cost savings, which is about 76 to 72%. I'm making assumptions for 2030 that our price of power will double for the electricity and also assuming that a gas car is going to get more efficient slightly over time. Um, but I don't imagine we're going to get much better than 47.3 miles to the gallon uh, for the average you know, mid-size car. So I think it's fairly safe to say that the cost savings are, are substantial. Usually it's about a quarter of the operating cost, but the emissions reductions are going to get cleaner and are better and better as we decarbonize our grid, which is part of that broader objective of electrifying everything and powering everything with clean energy. The next slide. But here, my point is, if you want, if you can, if you can do it, put up your own solar and then you're powering your electric cars with your own clean energy. And so this is just a picture of my wife and I in front of our solar system. And, and uh, so when you have solar powering your electric cars, the emissions reductions is closer to 90%. And this is the slide that I always had the hang up on. You might have to write, oh, there you go, okay. So this is, this is now data directly from SAS Power's uh, website. They have a little bit of a, uh, information piece on their website about uh, EVs. So they're saying much the same thing as my table did before, that by 2030, you can see all of these different vehicles. One one is the plug-in hybrid and then there's battery electric vehicles. And then the, you can see all of these trends as we move from 2020 to 2030, they are gonna be reducing emissions more and more compared to a comparable gas vehicle because the grid is going to be cleaned up. We aren't going to be relying as much on coal and on natural gas to get our power in the future. So this is a summary of, of what we've already talked about. Um, gas cars being only 12 to 25% efficient. The beauty of getting your power from a centralized source, you know, and working together as a community is a large power plant is usually much more efficient than an individual car. And when you think of how you use your car, especially in the winter time, you start it up, it's cold, it's got to warm up before it even gets to where it's operating efficiency, efficiently. Whereas the power plant in a central location is already running and is always operating at its best efficiency point. But the real key here is that we use a quarter of the energy with EVs compared to gas cars. Now this slide is incorporating the embodied emissions with manufacturing. So you often hear people say, the myth is that um, an EV battery takes so many emissions and is so dirty with mining associated with it and the power to produce and refine these materials, that gas cars are better. And well, this from the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency has quantified this. So on this slide, the big uh, yellow orangey kind of chunk, I'm colorblind, I apologize, but that 74% on the left is all life cycle um, fuel emissions while you use the car over its life cycle. And all of those emissions are embodied in the gray area, feedstock and fuel on the gas, or sorry, the electric car on the right. So. And this of course makes assumptions about a vehicle lasting for, you know, in the range of 120,000 miles before it's considered, um, you know, at the end of its life. 
But the key is that, yes, EVs might take marginally more emissions to manufacture, but within the first 10 to 40,000 kilometers, depending on the car and where it's manufactured, those extra emissions are more than saved or reduced through the operating of the vehicle. So here we have a slide showing just how many uh, electric vehicles there are uh, in Saskatchewan. Now, does this include plug-in electrics as well, Glenn, or just battery electrics? I believe this is just battery electrics. So uh, you can see how much uh, how much this is growing, and just anecdotally, what I have noticed when when I bought my car in uh, basically the start of 2019. Um, you know, I, I figured I was, uh, I, I always got really excited when I saw another electric vehicle on the road and I figured that was about once a week that I was, uh, was noticing, uh, another electric vehicle. Um, now I think it's strange if a day goes by and I don't see two other electric vehicles, uh, on, on the road. So, uh, that's a, that's a, um, that's a 14 uh, you know, 14 fold increase in, in four years, uh, just anecdotally, of course. So it's not, you know, it's not, uh, not very precisely measured, but, uh, but I find that most days, uh, I see two electric, uh, two other electric vehicles on the road today. I actually saw another electric smart car on the road and I was really excited. And this last bit here, this, um, 38% increase. Uh, that's just year to date for 2022 up to the end of August. So considering that we're recovering from a pandemic, we've got a global supply chain shortage, we've got inflation out the yin yang, um, and yet we're seeing this kind of dramatic increase in EVs in Saskatchewan where we have no policy to encourage the adaptation. In fact, we've got the policy from this government slapping on an additional $150 tax. So. Saskatchewan is actually being deprived of electric vehicles right now. They're primarily going to British Columbia and to Ontario and Quebec because those provinces either have mandates requiring manufacturers and dealers to sell EVs and also because they're providing provincial incentives in some cases to buy them. So it's hard to actually get an EV in Saskatchewan. You have to really work at it. Yeah, you have to order one because demand is actually uh, outstripping supply right now. And this is just speaking to what we talked about already. This, this is a national phenomenon. It's a worldwide phenomenon. EVs are following a very quick adoption curve and, and we have passed the, uh, you know, the early adopter stage. This is now mainstream. So this was a concept that Glenn introduced to me uh, probably about a year, maybe, maybe two years ago. I forget when it was. Uh, and it's called an S curve. And, and, and the S curve is basically uh, showing the adoption rate of disruptive technologies. So uh, it might be, uh, this could have been the, um, well, there's a fellow who talks about this, who has a picture, he, he starts his presentations showing two pictures of a street in New York City. Um, and I, I think they were a year apart. And uh, the one picture, um, you know, the street is filled with horses and the next picture, uh, there's not a horse to be seen. It's all, it's all uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. But the idea is with the S curve that it takes a long time, you know, those early adopters, it takes a long time for people to kind of get comfortable with the idea. But then, uh, then you kind of hit this tipping point and all of a sudden, you know, there's enough people that say, you know, they've seen their, their friends or their neighbors driving them, they've heard about them for a while, they've been thinking, yeah, that might be something I do, but I'm gonna wait for the price to come down or I'm not satisfied with the options. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wait and see. Um, and, and then you hit that tipping point. And then all of a sudden, like everybody and their dog has to have this new technology, this disruptive technology. And so the, the prediction is that uh, that electric cars will follow this same uh, adoption curve, and 
And I think when I see the numbers, when I think of my own experience, when I see the numbers coming from, uh, you know, the various places that measure uh, EVs, uh, I think we are just at the start of that, that exponential uh, steep part of the curve where we are going to see uh, fantastic uh, uh, growth over the next uh, over the next few years. Uh, my predictions are at the bottom there. I think in five years' time, the majority of new vehicle sales will be EVs. Um, uh, in ten years' time, I think uh, the majority of all vehicle sales will be EVs, and I think in fifteen years, the majority of all vehicles on the road will be EVs. And you know. Of course, you, you talk to somebody from Saskatchewan where we're still very much in a culture of denial um, uh, about this. Uh, you, you know, uh, th they might actually think you've uh, got a third eye in the middle of your forehead uh, if you tell them this. But I actually think there's a possibility that I might be too conservative on these uh, on these dates. So. So here we uh, here we come down to uh, you know the, the factors influencing your decision, and so you already heard a little bit about my about my decision making. Um, now, for me, when I bought my electric car, uh, it was very cheap uh, upfront investment, uh, twelve thousand um, dollars. I was driving uh, a fair bit of uh, uh, of city kilometers. Uh, on a daily basis. Uh, actually, one interesting thing about the difference between electric and, and gas vehicles is an electric vehicle actually is more efficient in the city because it's continually recouping the, uh, recovering the, uh, the energy uh, when you're slowing down at a light or, or, or having to stop uh, and you're driving at a, at a slower speed. Whereas when you're on a highway trip, there's really very few opportunities to, uh, to slow down and, and recover any energy. And uh, the higher speed means you're consuming more, uh, more energy. Uh, but the opposite is, is true in a, a, a gas vehicle, which you know, is normally that your, your gas consumption uh, in city driving is far higher than, uh, than it is um, uh, on the highway. So um, yeah, when I first started, uh, I had a high number of kind of daily kilometers. I was, uh, I was an MLA, so I was probably making somewhere between five and 10 trips, you know, uh, a day driving around the city somewhere. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, I, I'd kind of estimated uh, what my average daily kilometers were. And uh, even though my vehicle has a very short mm -hmm. range. Like I, I can't ever take my vehicle on highway trips. It, it's got a 120 kilometer range uh, at the most. So it's purely a city vehicle. Uh, but I figured that the, that the fuel savings uh, would, uh, would over time uh, at least cover the cost of um, uh, the additional cost of, of registration for my vehicle. Uh, now, lately I've been thinking you know, it's crazy for me to have three vehicles. Um, you know, could I get a vehicle where, um, you know, where, could I get rid of two vehicles by, um, um, uh, you know, by, by getting a, a vehicle with a bigger battery and, uh, and then having a vehicle, one vehicle that will both do longer trips and shorter trips? And the answer is yes, there are vehicles out there that will, uh, that will solve that need, but I pretty much have to look at a new vehicle at that point, and and I have uh, I have that same uh, miser uh, miserly approach to vehicles that Glenn does, and uh, so uh, I haven't quite. I, I figure my my total kilometers, both city commuting and long trips, don't really justify me dropping dropping uh, you know close to $50,000 into, uh, uh, into a vehicle at this point in time for me. I think if I could get a vehicle at $30,000 um, that would handle those long trips, I think it'd be a no brainer for me. Um, but, uh, but at $50,000, uh, the reality is I just don't do enough driving to, uh, to justify it on an economic basis. Um, you do have to look at 
both where you're going and where you're starting from. So I mentioned that my, uh, my parents and my uncle both have electric vehicles. Now you can't get much more rural than they are. Uh, they're, um, they're 100 kilometers from uh, both Lloydminster and North Battleford. So those are the two closest cities. Um, they're 250 kilometers away from, uh, from Saskatoon. Uh, they're, uh, they're about 30 kilometers away from the closest town. So they're, they're pretty, they're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, I think Bob, you've been, you've been to the farm there, you know how uh, isolated it is. Um, but th they can make an electric vehicle work. Now, most of their destinations uh, are going to be, uh, are going to be either going through uh, bigger cities where there's charging infrastructure, or, or the city will actually be the destination. Um, although I don't know, I do know that mom made one trip uh, this year from their farm basically down to Swift Current. And she had to, to use a different vehicle on that trip because there's no, there's no charging infrastructure, uh, you know, kind of in that west central part of the, uh, the province that uh, would enable her to, uh, to top, up her, uh, top up her battery. Um, one of the things, and Glenn has posted about this a lot of times uh, on social media, is you really have to look at, at the resale value, uh, not of your electric vehicle, but of your gas vehicle. Now, my plan right now, so I have a, um, I've got a Toyota Matrix that is, um, it's uh, 16 years old. Uh, I've got a great big gas guzzling Dodge Ram that is uh, 15 years old and I've got my little electric vehicle. And so I figure with all my vehicles, I'm not, uh, they don't have much resale value already and I'm not too concerned. I figure I'll probably drive them into the ground. Um, I'm not too concerned about it. But if I was buying a new vehicle right now, uh, I, I just don't, I can't see how it would possibly make sense to buy an internal combustion engine as a new vehicle right now. Um, because uh, you, you're faced with the higher operating costs. You know, if you, if you think of owning that vehicle for 10 or maybe even 20 years like I do, um, your operating costs over that life cycle will be far huger on, uh, on, the, uh, on the internal combustion engine. And if you think back to that S-curve, the other thing that's happening on that S-curve is once the, once the scales tip there, and everybody begins to rush for an electric vehicle, the resale value on that gas and diesel, uh, it plummets like a rock. Um, just think of your cell phones. Uh, you, you know, no, nobody was interested in buying an analog, uh, you know, phone once, um, you know, once a smartphone came along. Um, you know, nobody wants the old technology unless it's at a very serious price discount. So if you are buying a new uh, gas or diesel truck today, it's a, uh, you know, what, what do they cost? $70,000? Um, I, I would be really concerned that you're not gonna get, you're, you're never gonna recoup your, your value out of that vehicle. Glenn, anything to add on that? The change is coming very quickly. We just don't see it in Saskatchewan because we're kind of remote. We're the Alabama of Canada in some ways. And um, I listen to uh, occasionally a clean energy show podcast produced by two fellas from Regina. And on their show about two weeks ago, I think they mentioned that the island of Manhattan, so New York City, Manhattan now has more charging stations than there are gasoline stations. And the real estate value, once, once you have less demand for gasoline, people have come to realize that the real estate value is so high in Manhattan that you're better off to decommission the gas station and build some sort of commercial or, or residential space. So my whole outlook on life has changed. Every time I'm driving around, I look at all of the infrastructure that exists to support our fossil fuel based economy and our fossil fuel based transport. So. I don't see why we're going to need all these gas stations in the future. All these car dealerships that generally make most of their money on service and maintenance. That service and maintenance work is going to dry up. 
So this is a disruptive technology. EVs is better for the consumer. You're going to enjoy it more, but it, it, I think many of the people who exist in the automotive industry now, they fear that transition and they're trying to de delay it from happening. Uh, you know, and one thing that Glenn didn't mention when he was introducing himself is just how much of a, uh, what should I call you, a gearhead Glenn is? Like, Glenn loves vehicles. I, I forget, you told me one time you had something like 50 internal combustion engines on your on your farm. Um, uh, well, I mean, you, you, you got a sense of it. I mean, you have to love vehicles and love working on them to, uh, to basically convert uh, convert an old uh, an old truck to an electric vehicle. Um, uh, you know, I I, I kind of detest working on vehicles myself, but uh, but uh, but Glenn loves it, and and you know he's raced vehicles before. Um, you know, Glenn's Glenn's a car guy, um, uh, he, but this is what he's telling you. <laughs> I think we're nearing the end of our presentation. I'm sorry this has gone a little longer than I wanted, but we're both enthusiastic and I, I think this is actually you guys are pretty falling much, asleep. <laughs> I think this is pretty much our last slide. So um I uh th this is it's not really about electric vehicles that much. It's just about the, the dilemma facing us when it comes to climate change. And clearly electrifying things and electric vehicles as part of that are are a technological uh fix to to climate change. My concern is, uh, is, is, is what about psychology? Because there is a, uh, uh, an evidenced and, a, and documented trend that when we buy more efficient things, we just use them more. So, you know, and, uh, it, you know, if we buy that electric vehicle and it only costs us, uh, um, uh, you know, say, uh, five cents a, a kilometer to drive versus uh, 20 cents a kilometer in our in our gas vehicle do we say ah oh, I'm just gonna like you know do a whole bunch of road trips now that I wouldn't have before because it's so cheap uh, how, how can I not afford to uh, to make you know so we do a lot more driving and the thing with electric vehicles as with anything is th there still is there still is an impact on the uh, uh, on the environment um, you know, one of the things uh, uh, India and, and China are both with their massive populations, they're also becoming uh, wealthier countries and their, their middle class is, uh, is growing uh, at a very quick pace. But one of the, the alarming things for climate change is uh, as, they, uh, as that middle class grows, they want cars and they want to eat meat. Um, and so it's these these the psychological question. I'm like, how do we how do we actually change our behavior um, that uh, that sometimes keeps me up at night? And uh, I'm I'm going to quit talking here, but I wanted to share with you. A, a, um, I don't know. It's a, it, it, it's when when I start getting slack, this one always kind of kicks me in the belly, and um, and says uh, not to give up. Uh, this is a guy by the name of George Mon Monbiot or Monbiot uh, from from England who uh, writes a lot about climate change. And uh, in one of his books, he talks about us Canadians, and he says, "You think of yourselves as a liberal and enlightened people, but you could scarcely do more to destroy the biosphere if you tried." And he says, "You know, Canadians make the argument that our winters are colder, and that's why you know we use more uh, greenhouse gases." And he says. The climate doesn't care. Every ton of carbon you produce, however necessary you believe it to be, has the same impact on the climate as a ton emitted by anyone else. As nice and well-intentioned as you are, you do as much to drown Bangladesh or starve the people of the Horn of Africa as the most obdurate throwbacks in the shrinking state of Bushistan. Um, and, uh, you know, it's true. It doesn't matter whether we're, uh, you know, whether we're flying uh, you know, somewhere for uh, for a destination wedding or flying somewhere for uh, somebody's funeral. Um, you know, those those kilograms of CO two are going to be up in the atmosphere for uh, for a millennia, for a thousand years, and uh, the climate doesn't care. So, that's all I have to say.
I will, I guess, be the yin to the yang here. The final slides just show the various clubs in Saskatchewan. So there's a Tesla Owners Club, there is a uh, Sask EV in Saskatoon, and SIVA in Regina. So just look those up and they will be excellent resources for you if you've got any other questions or you can contact either of us. But uh, the yin to yin's yang, um, that I shared in the chat a recent report that was issued from the Rocky Mountain Institute on the energy transition narrative, they called it. It has a bunch of graphs in there showing what's already happening around the world in terms of change. So I oscillate daily between having hope and being optimistic and, and outright despair. And so if Jens's talk is perhaps a little bit more somber, I would encourage I encourage you to look at that Rocky Mountain Institute report because those graphs show you just how fast things are about to change. We needed to make drastic change in this decade, the 2020, 2030 decade. And I'm telling you that there's data showing in that report that shows you those changes are underway. So Saskatchewan better pay attention because we're an export country or uh, jurisdiction. We depend on people buying our goods. We better pay attention because it may be that people don't want our goods if we're not uh, recognizing the transition that's underway. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much.